discussion on molecular geometries and Vesper. And as we always do, go back a little bit, cover some ground, maybe press forward a little bit farther as we go through the rest of the course. I want to thank those of you that stayed yesterday for tutoring, both of you. Um, actually, you've already seen some of what we're going to do today. And since I didn't have it scripted yesterday, it might be the same stuff, but presented a little bit differently. But thank you also for giving me a warm up for today. I think it'll be helpful for your classmates in here for you allowing me to do that. I'll go ahead and put this off to the side. I mentioned yesterday the VESPER. It's actually spelled V-S-E-P-R. It's an acronym. What does it stand for? Okay, valence shell electron pair repulsion. Valence shell electron pair, pair repulsion. The idea here is that the electron pairs, whether they be an unbonded pair or a bonded pair that make up a molecule within a molecule, that they repel one another. And we're looking at geometries, we're actually looking at the relationship of the central atom to the other atoms around it that are bonded to it and looking at what would be considered the angles between those bonds. Now, like in my three-dimensional model here, the bonds are represented by these dowels. Okay? In actuality, there is no stick between the atoms, right? We understand now that these are electrons being shared, and the electrons being shared are what constitute a bond. However, if you visualize them as sticks, and you look at what would be the angle between these two sticks, we go to the center atom, go to the center of the center atom, and look at what is the angle that's formed between this stick and that stick. That's really what we're talking about. What is the bond angle? What is the angle between the bonds in the molecule? We're going to discuss five basic configurations. And we did them yesterday, or did most of them yesterday. We'll review them and then press ahead for the rest of them. Now when I talk about things that are bonded to the central atom, I realized yesterday I said things like the central atom has a valence desire of eight. One other way you might hear this put is that for the central atom, we're looking at how many things are attached to it. How many things are attached to it. The things that may be attached to the central atom include a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, or an unbonded pair of electrons. So in the other models that I showed you yesterday, there were some that had double white, the two white balls on top that represented an unbound or unbonded pair. That would be a thing, as would the, all these four single bonds, or as would a double bond. Remember, a double bond, a single bond, doesn't carry any significance with regard to the geometries. A double bond, a single bond, is still considered just a straight line bond. Yes, sir? Um, can you get any stronger than a bond? No. No, we're not going to. I, not that I'm aware of. I'm going to say in this course, it's beyond the scope of this. I don't think there are any quadruple bonds. But I could be wrong. But I don't believe there are any quadruple bonds. But definitely triples. We've already talked about, for example, homonuclear diatomic nitrogen. is a triple bonded molecule, which protects us from the Hulk rays, right, gamma rays. Okay. Part of our presentation yesterday too was talking about the central atom and I said a few times it's you know the first shape what is this shape with all four single bonds perfectly distributed tetrahedron yesterday during the during the tutoring time I said is this shape based upon a tetrahedron and I didn't emphasize this yesterday but when your central atom has four things attached to it a single bond it, it could be any combination of single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, or unbonded electron pairs, four different things. So here would be one, two, three, four things attached. On this one, with the unbound pair, uh, there are still four things attached. Three single bonds and an unbonded pair. It's still four things. If one of these was a double bond and we lost the pair, it would still be, it would be three things, not four things, because the double bond only counts as one thing. Okay, so kind of that idea of how many things are attached to the central atom. If there are four things attached to the central atom, the geometry is based upon a tetrahedron. It may not be a tetrahedral, but the shape is based upon a tetrahedron. And we'll, we'll flesh that out a little bit more in just a moment. 
So yesterday we covered, I think we covered the first four. We didn't get to the linear, but it's going to be pretty straightforward. So again, a slightly different way of presenting it. Here, what I'm presenting, I'm not saying that all the Bs have to be the same. I'm just trying to draw a distinction between the A, the center, and B, the surrounding elements on here, okay? So this could, could be, for example, carbon and four hydrogens. It could be, you know, carbon and four lithiums. It could be different things, okay? All I'm saying here is we've got a central atom and four things attached to it. Here we have a central atom and four things attached to it. In this case, it's three single bonds and an unbonded pair. This one as well has four things attached to the central atom. Two bonds and two unbonded pairs, still four things. When we go to the next shape over here, now we're into something different. Now we have a central atom and we have three things, not four. There is no unbonded pair because we have a double bond. So there's only three things attached to that central atom. And lastly, over here, this three atom molecule only has two things attached to the center, two double bonds, only two things. This case will also apply for homonuclear diatomics and single attached covalent bonded molecules. So we'll talk about that last. Let's count the same. A double bond is a thing. A single bond is a thing. An unbonded pair is a thing. A triple bond is a thing. How many things are attached to the central atom? So yesterday we went over this in tutoring. Said, recognize that these three shapes right here, these three geometries are all based upon a tetrahedron. Their basic shape is some variation of this. Why? They have four things loosely described as bonds or unbonded pair. There's four things around the central atom, okay? We have three different cases where there are four things around the central atom. In the case where those four things are four bonds, it is a tetrahedral. That is the shape. It is a tetrahedral. What does that look like in three-dimensional space or drawn in a two-dimensional plane? Remember, it's going to look, I'll use A's and B's like I did up here. We have a B bonded to an A, bonded to an, a B, with a B coming out and a B going behind. So if your shape is a tetrahedral, if this is your two-dimensional Lewis structure, the shape is a tetrahedral, and this is the three-dimensional drawing. Just refresh your memory. We're going to take two of these attached elements. We're going to lay them in a plane with the central atom. And from that point, you're going to have one atom that's coming out of the board towards you, which is represented by this triangle, and one that is going back into the board, which is represented by that dotted line. Okay. The angle, the bond angle. The angle between every one of these bonds in a tetrahedral is 109 degrees. Okay. So from any one of these sticks to any other one of these sticks, the angle is 109 degrees. Because 109 degrees is perfect symmetry in three dimensions in the same way that 90 degrees represents perfect symmetry in two dimensions. All right? So, four bonds forming the four things. The shape is a tetrahedral. It's drawn in this way, and the angle between the bonds is 109 degrees for all directions. Every way you look at it, it's 109 degrees between the, ang between the bonds. Okay? The next shape over. It has four things attached to the central atom. Three single bonds and an unbonded pair. Because it has four things... It is based on a tetrahedron. But it's not a tetrahedral. See the difference? It's based upon a tetrahedron, but it's not a tetrahedral. What's the difference? In this case, we talked about the unbonded pair. The only difference is this bond, this vertical bond here, is replaced by an unbonded pair. This is likely a, a 
um, column five element. Column five elements have an unbonded pair and three singles, which make nice attachment points for a single covalent bond to other elements. But what, remember what the shape was for this? It's my tripod, right? It's a pyramidal. A pyramidal. Well, think of it this way. You're going to have the same base, the same base, but no projection off the top. It's like a tripod. Okay? The tripod is going to be If I take this unbonded pair and one of these external atoms, I lay them in the plane of the board, I have one bond that's coming forward out of the board and one bond that's going back into the board. It's represented in this way in two-dimensional space. Now what is the effect of the unbonded pair compared to the bond? We mentioned this yesterday as well. What are the forces exerted by the unbonded pair? The unbonded pair exerts more repulsive force than a bond. So if this were a bond, it would be a tetrahedral, and it would be 109 degrees. It's not a tetrahedral. It's a pyramidal. I've replaced a bond with an unbonded pair. The unbonded pair pushes away harder than a bond does. Okay, Because it pushes away harder than a bond does, what happens to the other bond angles? They get squeeze. They get, they move away from the unbonded pair. They get squeezed towards each other. Okay, and so as this unbonded pair is pushing away harder than the bond would, the angle between the bonds decreases. The legs of my tripod here, the bottom part. If I replace that with the unbonded pair, they get squeezed just a little bit tighter together because they're being pushed away by this unbonded pair, a little bit stronger than a bond would. And what that does is the angle of the supporting legs, because they get pushed together, decreases down to 107 degrees. So we lose two degrees because this unbonded pair pushes down. Now think about it. We're talking about repulsion, right? Repulsive forces. If I have a bond right here, I'm sharing electrons. Where do those exi electrons exist at? Where are they at any given time? Well, they're going to be somewhere either around A or B, right? At times, they're going to be up here. At times, they're going to be down here. But they're moving in this space between A and B. If I have an unbonded pair, where are they all the time? They're not going anywhere else, right? They're right around their original atom. They're going to be hovering around here all the time instead of being located between A and B, they're always going to be here, which is why they exert more force. They're closer to the pivot point. They're closer to the place where the angles come from. The pivot point's the center of the center atom, and the po and points are the bonds. Because this unbonded pair stays close to home, it's still a pair of electrons. It still technically exerts the same force as a bond. However, it never leaves home. It's always there, always pressing. And the net effect is more force, which squeezes the legs together and changes it from 109 to 107 degrees. Okay? But this, this design is still based upon a tetrahedron because of the four. And the way I said it yesterday was, this is a tetrahedral. Think of a pyramidal as a warped tetrahedral. It's not a perfect tetrahedral. It's based on a tetrahedral. The, the other legs are just squeezed together a little bit misshaping it a little bit from being a tetrahedral. Now, it's all perspective, right? If you're a tetrahedron, you go, look at that misshapen tetrahedron. If you're a pyramidal, you're saying, I'm a perfect pyramidal. I'm not misshapen at all. This is the way God wanted me to be. Okay, so it's perspective. But if you think in terms of tetrahedron, this is perfect, this is slightly warped. Well, we go to even a more slightly warped tetrahedral. So based on a tetrahedron, because... One, two, three, four things around the central atom. Two bonds. Remember, these could be singles or doubles or triples. But two bonds and two 
unbonded pair. Four things. Is it based upon the tetrahedron? Yes. Why? Four things around the central atom. Is it the same as a pyramidal? No. It's not a tetrahedron. It's not a pyramidal. It's a third form based upon a tetrahedron. And we said that these were the bent molecules. Again, three-dimensional model. Two atoms attached to the central atom and two unbonded pairs of electrons. Again, they're going to place themselves equally around the central atom. This pair, this pair, this bonded pair, and this bonded pair. They're going to repulse each other. Valence shell, electron pair repulsion. They're pushing away from each other. But just as in this case where there is a pair that stays close to home and squeezes the other two legs, that happens yet again. We replace one of these bonds with an unbonded pair. It stays close to home, and it also exerts more force than it did before. And now these two that are left bonded are being squeezed even greater. They're being squeezed so that their shape looks like this. Because if I take this pair and I put it, you know, put it flush, now I've got this one coming out of the board, this one going back. This bond has been replaced by an unbonded pair. It's joining the other unbonded pair in pushing away the bonds from itself, which means squeezing them closer together, and we end up with a bond angle of 105 degrees. Okay. 105 degrees. Remember, that is the angle between the bonds. That is not the angle between a bond and an unbonded pair. That is not the angle between an unbonded pair and an unbonded pair. This is only the angle between every bond with every other bond. In this case, there's only two bonds, so it's this angle at the bottom that we're talking about. This would be 105 degrees. In this case here, it's between the sticks, if you will, the way you see it, between the bonds. Not between the bonds and the unbonded pair. Between the bonds is 107 degrees. In this case, between every bond, they're all 109 degrees. So if the question is asked, is the geometry based upon a tetrahedron, what's the thing you're going to ask yourself to answer that question? If the question, one more time, if the question is, is the geometry of a molecule, of this, of any particular molecule, based upon a tetrahedron, how do you know if the answer is yes or no? If I give you a molecule, whether I give you the Lewis structure or not, if I could just write a molecule down for you and ask you, is its geometry based upon a tetrahedron? You could say yes or no. How would you know if it is or is not based upon a tetrahedron? Yes? If it has four things attached to the central atom, right? So you draw the Lewis structure, the two-dimensional Lewis structure, and you count up the things. Remember the things are bonds, Singles, doubles, triples, or unbonded pair. How many things? Four. Yes, it's based upon a tetrahedron. How many things? Four. Yes, it's based upon a tetrahedron. How many things? One, two, three, four. Four. Yes, it's based upon a tetrahedron. These three shapes are all best based upon a tetrahedron. In this case, four bonds is a tetrahedral. Three bonds is a pyramidal. And two bonds is a bent of 109, 107, 105, respectively. So if you were given a molecule and said it's a bent molecule, what is the bond angle? It, does it really matter what the molecule is? Does it matter to you what the actual elements involved or what the actual molecule is? If I tell you it's a bent molecule, it's 105 degrees. Bent molecules are 105 degrees. 105 degrees is the geometry of a bent molecule. A bent molecule is based upon a tetrahedron with only two bonds and two unbonded pairs. So you don't need to know what the elements are. The only time you would need the elements is to draw the initial Lewis structure. Oh, and if you can draw the initial Lewis structure, this is always the geometry of the tetrahedral. This is always the way you draw the pyramidal, and this is always the way you draw a bent. It's just a matter of 
which elemental symbol you're going to put on the inside and which elemental symbols you're going to put on the external atoms based upon the formula for the molecule you're given. So this could be a CH4. Well, if you get CH4, just think in terms of symmetry, central carbon, four around it, four around it, that's four bonds, that's four things. It's a perfect pyramidal. You can draw this right away. It's going to be, but if you go to the two-dimensional, see it from that, go to the three-dimensional. So if you can do this by the characteristic of four bonds, it is a tetrahedral. This is how you draw it. The answer is 109 degrees. So if you had a quiz, for example, like the one you had today, and the different columns were, you know, the Lewis structure, it's whether it's based upon a tetrahedron or not, its shape, its angle, and its geometry, how to draw it in three dimensions. If you know this right here, you can draw every single tetrahedral molecule that we have because they're all the same except for what actually goes in the place of A and B. But everything else is the same for your answer. So if it's a tetrahedral, it is 109. It does look like that. This is its name, and this is what its two-dimensional Lewis looks like. Next case over, pyramidal. It's probably going to be a column five element. It's going to have three things attached to it, single bonds. It's a pyramidal. A pyramidal, this is a name. It looks like this, and that is the angle. Why? Because it's a pyramidal. They all look like that. Same thing with the bent. The classic bent is what? Because you'll be asked this, because everybody gets asked this a bazillion times. What is the classic bent molecule that we're the most familiar with? Water, right? You said H2O? Yeah, water. Also known as the Mickey Mouse molecule, right? Because you have a central and two outsides. Okay, Mickey Mouse. It's a bent molecule, and this is incredibly important. We're going to get into why that is as we move on to the last half of the module, talking about polarity. Polar and nonpolar molecules. Okay, so these three shapes, 60% of the shapes we're going to discuss are based upon a tetrahedron. They're based upon a tetrahedron because they have four things attached to the central atom. Four, three, or two bonds. Because of the four, three, or two bonds, they have these names and they're drawn this way with these bond angles. So, you know, if you have a hard time figuring out, memorize these three cases. And then all you need to do is say, is the molecule I've been asked to look at shaped like this, this, or this? <laughs> The rest of this will just flow from your memory if, if you just need to rote memorize it. But this is also, I think, we present enough of a logical reasons why the shape is the way it is. Like I start with 109, I know it's 109. This squeezes a little more and this squeezes a little, little more and they squeeze by two degrees at, a, at an interval. So 109, 107, 105. If you ask me what is the angle of a bent, I think 109 minus four, it's 105. That's just the way I memorized it, okay? Next case over. We talked about this type of molecule. Is it based upon a tetrahedron? Is that molecule, is it shaped based upon a tetrahedron? It's not. It only has three things attached to the central atom. Three bonds, a single, a single and a double. Three bonds, three things. So it's not a morph of the, f of the tetrahedron. It's its own thing. It's something different. Remember what the name of this is? Almost looks like a weapon, right? A shuriken of some kind. Just put a few razor blades on the end and phew. Okay. Pardon? I was thinking more of a martial arts movie, but whatever is what's your boat. Mm. We didn't use shuriken in our dojo. Yeah, I, 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 I specialized in knife fighting. So, three-dimensional. Also, virtually two-dimensional. See that? As you look down the plane of the, of the atoms that make the molecule, it's all in the same plane. If this were done perfectly, these, the centers of these bonds and the centers of these atoms would all lay in a f flat plane. The only thing that gives it dimensionality is the thickness of the atoms themselves, not any bond that comes forward, not any bond that goes backward. The same is here for the linears. 
There, there are no things coming out of the board towards you, and there are no things going back into the board away from you. They're all in a plane, which means this no notation of the triangle filled in and the dotted line, it's only applicable to those things that are based upon a tetrahedron. They don't apply to the trigonal or the linear. It's a trigonal. Some people remember it because if you take these points and draw lines between them from here to here, it forms a triangle. It's not a triagonal, but hopefully triangle will lead you to remember trigonal. It forms a triangle. Okay. It's three-dimensional Lewis, or it's, it's Vesper diagram, which I sometimes call the three-dimensional Lewis diagram. Based looking at its two-dimensional, what is the difference between this and what we're going to draw for the three dimensions? Again, there's nothing coming out of the board, nothing going into the board. So how does it look different when we draw the three-dimensional Lewis structure? The three-dimensional Vesper diagram. What's going to be the difference? What's the difference between those two? Just the angles. Just the angles that I've drawn the between the bonds. Now, I've placed the double bond on top because that allows me to cut it down the middle and have symmetry on both sides. The double bond could be anywhere. It could be any one of those three. Because, you know, let's say that this is the, this is the molecule, and you make a real hard case that this needs to be the double bond. I'll go with that. Okay, fine. Or guess what? We'll leave it here, and we'll move. Because it's all relative space, right? Wherever I put the double bond, it's relative. But for us, sitting here in three-dimensional space, looking at a two-dimensional object, our minds work better with symmetry. So it makes more sense for me to put the symmetrical left and right symmetry by putting the double bond on top. It could be three single bonds based upon whatever the molecule is, right? It could be, it could be that. And then it represents exactly like this three-dimensional model that I have. So there is no coming out of the board. There is no going back into the board. It all lays in a flat plane. What is the angle between them? This is where you take a perfect 360-degree circle and you break it up into three different pieces. If you take a pie and cut it into three pieces, how many degrees is each piece? Not radians. I know you all want to go to radians right away, but let's not go there right now. How many degrees? If I take a pie and cut it in half, how many degrees are in each half? Okay, how many degrees are in a circle? 360 degrees. How many is a half of that? 180 degrees. So if I take a pie and I cut it in half, each piece is 180 degrees of pie. Not pie as in rho, the Greek symbol pi, but in the piece of pie, blueberry pie. Or what, what do you all eat down here in Kentucky? Chocolate pecan pie. No, not chicken pie. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let what I'm talking about pie, not the symbol pie. I'm talking about the actual pie like I would say like grandma makes, but maybe you go to Walmart and buy for, for Thanksgiving. Okay, because that's kind of where we're going nowadays. Take the pie, cut it in half. Each piece is 180 degrees of pie. If I take a whole pie, cut it into three pieces. Each piece is 120 degrees of that pie. If I take it and cut it into four pieces, each piece is 90 degrees of pi. Take and cut it into five pieces. 72 degrees, right? How about six pieces? 60 degrees. How about seven pieces? It's not so simple, is it? 360 divided by seven. So when I was flying a helicopter, we've got to turn this back to the Marine Corps now. When I was flying a helicopter, we had two different models of the helicopter that I flew. One of them had six rotor blades. One of them had seven rotor blades. There's a very important principle in flying helicopters is that you have to have a balanced rotor head over top of you. If it's unbalanced, it's kind of like driving with a bulging tire in the back. You know, some of you are used to that, but some of us aren't, you know? So driving with this bulging tire that's about to blow, you're driving on the road, like we're taking all over the place. So in a helicopter, you need to balance the rotor head, and you do that by getting all the blades perfectly equally distant apart. Well, if, if you have six rotor blades, the answer is 
easily 60 degrees. So you go up there and do little mechanical changes to make sure that all the blades are 60 degrees apart. The helicopter I flew had seven rotor blades. So who's the genius who designed that system? That you take 360 degrees and divide it by seven. And what do you get? I don't know. What do we get? Thirty-five, one zero, one seven, three zero. What? Four, right? Twenty-eight, two comes down zero, two, fourteen, six, zero, eight is fifty-six, four, bring down the zero, five is thirty-five, five, bring down the zero, seven. See, so. 50, and I'm just going to stop there, but it needs to be 51.42857 degrees apart. Guess what? I often wrote a little bit of shake going on because it was hard to balance those seven compared to six. 60 degrees apart. But it was nice because we could fly over 200 miles an hour and we could lift over 36,000 pounds. So that extra blade came in handy with the three engines. So every one of these, go back to ge uh, chemistry, geometry, Math, philosophy, every one of those bonds are 120 degrees apart. So if you draw your two-dimensional Lewis structure and you say, how many things are attached to the center? Four? Nope. Okay, it's not based on a, you know, a, a tetrahedral. It has how many things attached to the center, Adam? Three. Three things. Okay, three things, it's a trigonal. The angles are 120 degrees apart in the plane. Now there are modifications of this as well, okay, but we're not gonna get into all those modifications because there is a case where you'd say, okay, replace one of those things with a unbonded pair. Let's speculate now, what would happen? If I take this and I replace one of them with an unbonded pair, what's going to happen to the angle between these two? Closer together, right? So this unbonded pair here would push down and squeeze these together so it's going to be slightly less than 120 degrees. But I don't think our book takes us there. I think it just asks us for these three, then trigonal, and then linear. Linear. This is the case, the three-dimensional that I did that I said I don't think the book takes us into, but this is the, the trigonal with an unbonded pair replacing one of the bonds. So as I said, this would push harder than these bonds, so it would squeeze these two together, bringing it to be slightly less than 120 degrees apart on the bottom. The last case is linear. Does any rocket scientist want to help me out with what the angle on a linear model, a linear molecule is? And when I say rocket science, I say that with a great amount of respect, by the way, so don't think I'm, I'm dissing you or anything when I say any rocket scientist. The person who we bought our home from, he was a PhD at NASA but he left that career to become a, a medical doctor. So he's a doctor, a PhD doctor, and an MD doctor. So. A linear. Straight line. Good. How many degrees of angle are in a straight line? Let's pretend I have a, an angle here that's, oh, 45 degrees, right? And I increase that angle straight up and down. I now change it to be 90 degrees. And then I push it into the second quadrant over here, and now I have an angle of 135 degrees. I push it over here all the way until it's a straight line, and I have an angle of 180 degrees. So a linear has a bond angle of 180 degrees a linear bond angle of 180 degrees. And there are several different ways that you can get a linear angle. One linear, I'll do this one, this is the bottom one I represented here, is a molecule that has, so a model that has a central atom, a pivot atom, and two attached atoms to it with two different bonds. Here I'm just showing single bond because frankly double bonds like this are hard to, Hard to show. Very seldom is it going to be a central with two external with two single bonds. It just doesn't happen. These would be doubles because doubles would satisfy, you know, the octet for the central. 
atom in most cases. So, but this is representing a straight line. This straight line looks something like this on a two-dimensional Lewis. You have a central atom and perfect symmetry with the other two atoms involved in the molecule. Anytime this one would tend, if this one ever did have a tendency to come closer this way, this one would push back away and would also be repelled this way. And so it would continually be perfectly, perfectly in line. Another way would be to have two atoms bonded to each other. In this case, is there a pivot atom? Is there a central atom? There isn't. Every other atom has had a central pivot atom. This case, this case, this case, this case, and even this case has had a central atom, which was the pivot atom. The central atom from which at its very core is the pivot point for determining the angle between the bonds. In this case, there is no central atom. Two atoms bonded to each other, a linear angle, 180 degrees. There technically is no pivot, but it's straight, therefore it's 180. And in this case, if I say that these are both the same exact element, two atoms of the same element bonded together, what does this then represent? From our, from our nomenclature over here, we have a particular case of elements which bond together with other atoms of their own type to form a molecule in their natural state. What do we call those? They form the seven with hydrogen added in. Two, element, two atoms of the same element which naturally bond together to form molecules. homonuclear diatomics. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine. When those atoms are together, what do they naturally do? They form a bond with each other. If we have a fluorine in proximity to another fluorine, what are they going to do? They're going to bond to complete each other's octet. Boom, this is what this represents. Two identical element atoms bonded together with a single covalent bond. It's a homonuclear diatomic, which looks amazingly like, oh, what's next? Chlorine. Chlorine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's exactly the same. Oh, guess what bromine would look like? Erase the F, put in a BR. What would iodine look like? Erase the F, put in an I. They all look just like this in three-dimensional model. Okay. Now, granted, when we do something like this, where I'm not showing the unbonded pairs around each of the end atoms, I'm concerned about the unbonded pairs around the pivot atom, around the central atom. The unbonded electrons around the external atoms aren't in getting involved in the geometry of the molecule. Okay. Now, there will be times, for example, usually with a trigonal, where we're talking about pairs one of these might be a double, and they'll have a couple electrons on the outside. Again, on three-dimensional, you'd hope that you would recognize to separate those by 120 to make nice symmetry around that atom. In a two-dimensional Lewis, it might have looked like that. But you're showing two unbonded pairs and two, bonded, two bonds. In three dimensions, you would take those and you would offset them so that the pair, pair, and bonds, they form 120 degrees apart from each other as well. So in your book, let me flip the page over one. Page 182 and 183, they walk through each one of these types of geometries and give you some representations of how to do it. Now, in their model, they use springs rather than dowels, for example, to show their, their modeling. They don't always use dowels. They use dowels for single bonds. They use springs for double bonds to show you those differences. But in the geometry, a double bond, a triple bond, a single bond, or an unbonded pair are the same thing, a thing around the central atom. Okay? Let's go ahead and, we've only got about a minute. We're going to pick up tomorrow with the examples 
on page 183, pick up and go through the examples of figuring out based upon the given the symbols for the molecule, drawing the two-dimensional Lewis structure of the molecule, and then figuring out its name to draw it in three dimensions and what is its angle. And so this will be, you know, this probably won't be on tomorrow's quiz, but it'll be coming up pretty quick. So start now memorizing what is a tetrahedral, a pyramidal, a bent, a trigonal, and a linear look like. Because if you've got those cases memorized, how to draw them and what their angles are, then it's just a matter of doing the Lewis and figuring out which one you're going to write down on the paper. Mm -hmm. That this is a tetrahedral that looks like this with 109 degrees. These dimensions, just so you know, kind of fill the time, make it productive. These geometries are very important because the next thing we're going to get into is polarity. Okay? Polarity. Polarity is, yes, in the molecule, we say that it's a balanced molecule. There are no extra charges. The molecule has a net charge of zero. But electronegativity tells us, remember? Electronegativity is the amount of force that an electron uses to get another electron. So electronegativity is that force of pulling, that there's different amounts of pull within the electron, or excuse me, within the molecule. So though the molecule might be balanced, one side of it may have a charge that's negative, and one side of it may have a charge that's more positive, and that affects the chemistry of the molecule. Hey, Tyler. 